Good evening, and my name is Katie Okert, and I am an extension educator with Michigan State University Extension. Um, this is a brand new series that Extension is bringing to you um, in conjunction with our CWD outreach and education initiatives. Um, this session will be recorded and available for later viewing for those who are not able to attend live. We have roughly uh, 45 participants that are registered for the webinar, um, which we're so thankful for. MSU is open to all. Um, our programs are accessible and open to anybody who desires to learn. Um, after this webinar, by the end of the week, you will receive a copy of the link to the recorded and cl closed captioned webinar. Additionally, you'll receive a link to a survey that will, in will evaluate each individual session of this webinar series. So even if you're, at if you're attending this uh, webinar and viewing the recording link, please uh, make sure to go to that survey link and give us some feedback um, as we work to improve our online programming efforts. Zoom may or may not be new to you. Um, just a few things that I'd like to highlight for you. Um, this is a webinar format rather than a meeting. So as you have questions, at the bottom panel on your screen, you should see a button that says Q&A. At any point in time, if you have questions, please go ahead and type those into that Q&A box. Um, and at the end of the presentation, Chad will um, be ready to engage in conversation and answer those questions that you have as we go. Additionally, we have a polls feature. And one of the things that I am interested in is if you have ever participated in an MSU extension program in your community. And you can answer yes, no, or unsure. Okay, well, thank you to those of you who have not um, participated in an extension program before. Um, welcome, and we hope that you enjoy your time. And we want you to know that Extension has a variety of programs it, available to you in your communities. Every county in Michigan has an MSU Extension office, and we have different specialty areas, um, youth development, um, family and consumer sciences, agriculture, and um, community engagement and planning. So there's a variety of programs that Extension um, brings information into the communities, and, and I welcome you to uh, get to know your local Extension folks. So with that, I am very pleased to introduce uh, Chad Stewart tonight. He is our first speaker in the lineup. Chad is from the Michigan Department of Natural Resources and is the Deer, Elk, and Moose Management Specialist. He's been serving in that position for five years. And prior to that, he was the State Deer Biologist for the Indiana DNR and a Wildlife Biologist for the Smithsonian's Conservation Biology Institute in Virginia. Chad has a BS from a bachelor's degree from Penn State University and a master's degree from the University of Illinois and is a certified wildlife biologist. We're so happy that Chad could join us tonight and I appreciate his wealth of information and um, he is always a great resource. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Chad. All right, thank you, Katie. Um, I think I have to start off with the obligatory, can you hear me and can you see everything okay? I think you're good, Chad. Great. Okay, um, well, good evening, everyone. Um, I, uh, Katie asked me to provide a little bit of information on some of the upcoming changes to our current deer regulations and some other information uh, regarding deer management in Michigan. So I put together a reasonably short uh, presentation that goes over quite a bit of uh, information. Um, it's important to know that our deer management, um, though things seem to change every year, um, our actual deer regulations tend to be on three year cycles. So they're actually supposed to be consistent for three year periods uh, as we 
collect information and data and gauge the impact of any regulation change that we make. However, in recent years, um, because of some of the detections of chronic wasting disease and some significant winters in the Upper Peninsula, we have been making uh, and responding to those changes as, as more information becomes available. So it does seem that we are doing deregulations every year, um, but it's, it's certainly not by design, it's more uh, by response. So I, there's certainly a lot to cover. I'm gonna dive right into it. Um, our DEER program here in Michigan has a, a, a mission statement and I've got it uh, highlighted there. Uh, it can be found in our DEER management plan. Uh, you guys can certainly read faster than I can talk, but I'll highlight some of the statements that you see such as scientific management, maximizing recreational opportunity, and minimizing negative impacts on ecosystems. All of these are foundational ideals in how we develop recommendations for deer management. So uh, it's not just managing deer for hunters. We also have to manage it, uh, deer, and, and that resource for the entirety of uh, the constituency of Michigan. Katie wanted me to talk about how deer regulations are developed. Um, and I thought that was a certainly appropriate question given that we just recently past some changes and it's a process that not many people are familiar with. So I tried to develop a graphic that sort of shows how this process works. And our deer regulation process typically starts internally within the Department of Natural Resources as expanded conversations between deer program staff and field staff. So the biologists, the technicians, um, others that work in the field in the DNR. We take the data, we analyze the data, we look at a lot of that information, and we try to develop a direction in where we wanna go. Now, we try to fit uh, regional desires into a statewide framework, but we understand that with, with that, um, because Michigan is so diverse, uh, especially north to south, that there are sometimes sacrifices that need to be made occasionally. Um, we then take our recommendations up through our DNR executive office for approval. So um, me, the DEER program, the field staff are, are really in what we call the wildlife division. Uh, we often consult with uh, law enforcement division on certain items as well. And that is all overseen by our DNR executive office. And once it gets through and is signed off on by our DNR executive office, it goes to our Natural Resources Commission. Now, if you are not familiar with the Natural Resources Commission, it is a seven member appointed panel by both present and past governors, and they have the final say in our deer regulations, as well as any regulations pertaining to the manner and method of take for game in, in Michigan. Likewise, uh, our Natural Resources Commission, our commissioners, our DNR executive office, uh, they also have questions that come up and they float them back down to our field staff and our DEER program to evaluate some of these questions. Uh, so you can see that there's multiple feedback loops uh, internally with our DEER regulations. In addition to that, we solicit input from stakeholders uh, and they can be affiliated with uh, a professional organization, or they can just simply be individuals who are unaffiliated but have an interest in overall deer management. And this, this input is gathered either through formal or informal processes. So sometimes we request it, sometimes it's given to us. Um, in any regard, we, we listen to that, we take notes on it, um, and we certainly can incorporate that into the recommendation or it can be incorporated into the decision process. Um, and that feedback, typically when it's administered through the Natural Resources Commission, has typically led to what we call several amendments every cycle that incorporates the feedback. So what I, what I mean by an amendment is um, the regulation package that we initially developed is changed by the Natural Resources Commission because of some of the input that they have received uh, through the public engagement process. Now, in addition to that, uh, the, the deer regulation setting process, legislation can develop our hunting laws as well. And obviously that is crafted and passed by our elected officials in Lansing. So when you put both of these together, it leads to the information that ultimately goes into our hunting digest that is printed each year. 
So the laws that, are, that come out of uh, the, our Natural Resources Commission or our, our legislature are categorized into two separate ways. Um, so under the Natural Resources Commission, that law is written and, and considered our wildlife conservation order, or a lot of times we refer to it as WCO. And a good way to think about a wildlife conservation order is that it deals with everything that has to do with the manner and method of take, typically, how, uh, typically housed within that document, that, that, that specific order. Um, a perfect example is our, our hunting seasons, our, our hunting structure that is captured by our wildlife conservation order. So if we make a change to the hunting season, it comes as a request from the DNR and our Natural Resources Commission and, and those commissioners weigh the pros and cons of that change based on some of the science that our department presents and how that is uh, perceived or impacts our stakeholders and, and our public. Now other regulations uh, that are developed by our legislature uh, is a part of what's called Michigan Compiled Law and that is essentially anything that can be passed by our legislature. Uh, typically, these laws complement the work that's done by our Natural Resources Commission, but some overlap does exist. Uh, one example of a hunting law that's created under what we call MCL is our Hunter Orange Law. So our Natural Resources Commissioners have no authority on developing Hunter Orange. They can certainly make a recommendation, but ultimately it's our elected officials that develop our Hunter Orange Law. It's also worth noting that MCL uh, supersedes WCO. And what I mean by that if, is if our Natural Resources Commission passes one thing and then our elected officials pass something else that contradicts that, what is written in MCL will win out over what is passed in WCO. Now, it's generally um, beneficial to keep items in WCO because they're much more flexible and easier to change if, if something goes wrong one way or the other than it is to go uh, have it written in MCL. Uh, I was also asked to talk about how our agency is funded. And I found this graph online through uh, some help from our staff that talks about the 2020 fiscal year and the appropriations with how our overall department is funded. And as you can see, 70% of our department is funded by what we call state restricted fees. Uh, that is, uh, and, and the biggest part of that 70% uh, is the 20% that come, 20% of that comes from our hunting and fishing license fees. So uh, when hunters and, and anglers buy a license, they are really the key component in uh, contributing to conservation in the state of Michigan. Now, some of the other items included in this state restricted category are royalties from oil and gas and mineral extraction or timber sales on game and fish lands. Um, also included in that category are park fees from camping, recreation, the recreation passport, and motor vehicle permit fees. Now, if you go to the next largest category, the federal side of things, um, that is the money that we get uh, from things like the Pittman-Robertson Wildlife Restoration Act, which actually is uh, the anniversary of the passage of that is actually today. Uh, so that law was passed in 1937. And what it does is uh, it collects an excise tax on things like firearms and ammunition and provides that as federal aid to states for management and restoration of wildlife. So revenue uh, from an 11% tax on firearms, ammunition, uh, bows, et cetera, and a 10% tax on pistols, handguns, revolvers, uh, and a 43 cent tax per arrow shaft is collected um, and appropriated to states based on the number of licensed buyers that they have. The counterpart to the Pittman-Robertson Act is what they call the Dingle Johnson Sport Fish Restoration Act. And that was passed in 1950 and that collects taxes on fishing equipment. So the revenue from a 10% tax on fishing equipment, 
3% on electric motors uh, and duties from imported items like tackle are, are generally uh, included in this category. You can see the general fund, that's the state fund. Uh, we ha only have about 11% of our budget made up of that. So that, that money is allocated to us by our elected officials as part of our state budget. And then occasionally we receive uh, some money from private donations as well. So before I get into some of the regulations, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, really some of the challenges we have to both current and future deer management. And we looked at a lot of this information in developing our, our regulations for 2020 and some of the changes we made. The first uh, challenge that I wanted to bring up is, is to acknowledge that deer are extremely reproductive. Now, I, I don't know what everybody's um, previous understanding of deer biology is, but essentially a white-tailed deer can begin breeding really as early as about uh, six to seven months of age. So the fawns that you saw in May potentially can, can be sexually mature by the end of the year, especially if they hit about 80 pounds uh, in weight. Um, so it's possible for fawns to, to be bred um, even in their first year. And there's no, uh, there's no reproductive senescence in white-tailed deer either. So they will continue to have fawns for the duration of their life, which uh, typically is, is twins in a, in a healthy habitat, can be as many as triplets, uh, and only when they are really extremely young or, or in poor health do they tend to have one. But uh, we have a, 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 biology, or a, a researcher, I guess, on staff whose name is Dr. Dwayne Etter, uh, who recently completed uh, some, a study and is in the process of publishing that study. Uh, and it looked at one of the projects he worked on in Illinois. It was a multi-year removal uh, from a population, a closed population of white-tailed deer. And what he found was that it takes about 40% removal of your deer herd every year just to simply maintain a stable population. So when you look at the vertical axis there, what's identified as lambda, lambda essentially talks about the, the growth rate of a deer population, with one being a stable growth rate year to year. Everything above one indicates a growing deer herd, everything below one on that vertical axis represents a declining deer herd. And then on the horizontal axis, you see the percentage of deer uh, that are removed from a population. So as you see, the, the higher up that you go in terms of how many more deer you, you re remove from a population, uh, even over 70%, it makes sense that you have a reduced population the next year. The contrary to that is if you are removing 25 or maybe even 35% of your deer herd, you can potentially still have more deer the next year than you had the year before. And that's because of something called density dependence. Uh, the, the best way to say that is um, deer population and reproduction are inversely related. So, the more deer you have on the landscape, the fewer fawns you're going to have. The, the contrary to that, the, the opposite of that, it also holds true. The fewer, uh, the fewer does you have, the fewer deer you have on the landscape, the more reproductive they're going to be. So you tend to see rapid responses in overall population. And to keep up with that rapid response and that uh, account for that increased reproductive behavior, uh, you really need to be aggressive with your overall deer management strategy. And that can be a challenge because uh, Dr. Edder talked also about, as talk more about uh, the relationship between time it takes for a hunter to harvest a deer and the overall deer density. And most people think that that relationship is linear. And what I mean by that is if you start with a certain number of deer and cut it in half, it's logical to think that it would take twice as long to harvest a deer the next year because your population is cut in half. And as you can see, that's not necessarily the case by some real world scenarios here. You can actually take a population of deer and reduce it quite dramatically um, and really ha have little to no impact on the time it takes for a hunter to harvest a deer. It's not until your deer population gets to, to very low levels 
when you actually start getting exponentially harder to harvest a deer. So what this uh, figure really sort of represents is the old adage where hunters are going to wipe out all the deer is just not going to hold true because it takes so much uh, longer to harvest a deer when they're at low densities. Uh, it just is not, it's not a possible realistic outcome in today's society. And one of the reasons why it's not a realistic uh, I, you know, ideal in this society is because we have a declining hunter base. And I'm sorry, but this is some of the grimmest data uh, that you will probably see if you're a passionate deer hunter. Um, we have lost nearly 300,000 deer hunters in Michigan alone since before the turn of the century. So uh, by, 20, by, the, by the year 2000. Furthermore, we are going to lose over 100,000 deer hunters in the next decade. So to put it in perspective, to perspective uh, where I manage deer in Indiana, uh, we did not even have 300,000 deer hunters in that entire state. So in 20 years, the state of Michigan has lost more than the hunting populace equivalent of the state of Indiana. And you can see on the left-hand chart there, um, overall, hunter numbers have been declining tremendously um, over time. And on the right is the age demographic that sort of accompanies that decline. What you can easily see is that the hunters who in the late 1990s or the early 2000s, who are maybe in their 40s or 50s when we had a peak, are aging out. You know, those hunters are now in their 60s and 70s in the 2020s. And as you can also see, the number of younger hunters that we're seeing enter the sport are not enough to keep up with the attrition of hunters from, from that, that previous generation. So what that translates to is an overall net loss in hunters every year. I have one more figure to show you regarding this, um, and it really focuses on uh, individuals who are anywhere between nine and 11 years old every three years. And we've been able to track their hunting participation over time. And you can see that if you were nine to 11 years old in 1997, you were identified by that dark blue line, which is also the tallest peak. And you can see that it's pretty consistent that we can keep those individuals hunting uh, really through their teens, okay? But, and that's because largely they're probably living at home. Uh, they probably have a, a dedicated mentor. And then you can see as they either go away to college or begin you know, a young career uh, with whatever job they choose, they tend to lapse. And then they might come back a little bit later as they become a little bit more established. But overall, we're not seeing that many, we're not seeing them come back to the same level that they were when they were in their teens. And you can see over time going through the different colors the peak gets lower and lower and lower through that teenage years. Um, and we can just anticipate that the 2018 cohort, which we obviously don't have as much data for, which is that sort of pinkish, uh, beigeish line, um, the peak is not going to be as high. And we anticipate that those individuals are not going to be retained as well over time. So again, very grim uh, overall uh, prognosis in terms of our overall hunters over the next uh, 10 years or so. And finally, another challenge we have is our transmissible diseases that we have in Michigan. And we anticipate that these diseases will spread um, through, through parts of our deer herd. The first uh, and probably what you've heard mostly about is chronic wasting disease. It gets a lot of uh, play uh, both here in Michigan and in the national media. Uh, you can see that this is the updated map of where uh, positive chronic wasting disease animals have been identified. Most of the positive animals are in Montcalm County and northeastern Kent County, but you can see uh, parts of eight other counties where we've identified deer that were positive for the disease. Now, why is chronic wasting disease uh, such a concern? Uh, it is a disease that is caused by what's, uh, what's called a prion, and a prion is a misshapen protein that can actually persist in the environment for quite some time. And just one example, uh, we looked at some of the data in uh, Southwest Sauk County, which is in Wisconsin, and you can see the prevalence rates over time for both yearling males and males, which are on the top, 
increased substantially, significantly, uh, since when they first started looking in 2002, when they first identified the disease. Uh, so you can see prevalence was essentially near 0%, uh, very small at the turn of the century. In 2019, uh, for adult males, you have prevalence rates that are approaching 60%. So another way to say that is if you're a two and a half year old male in this part of Wisconsin, it is literally a coin flip whether or not you have CWD or don't have CWD. And you can see similar trends occurring for both yearling females and adult females as well in this same area. So why is CWD concerning? Uh, what does prevalence mean? Uh, well, typically, if uh, again, from a, a study from Wisconsin uh, is starting to show, if you're a deer that has CWD, the likelihood of you uh, surviving through the course of the year is about three times less than an animal that does not have CWD. So you can see quite a dramatic difference in survival um, in this study, which admittedly is preliminary. It has not gone through a peer review process. It is in progress, but um, we know a lot of the research is the work that's being done. We have no reason to believe that this research will not eventually be published in the, in the coming years. Now, are all these deer dying from chronic wasting disease? Probably not. Uh, certainly some of them are or uh, CWD related complications, but they are getting uh, uh, predated by, by predators. Um, they are getting struck by vehicles. They're getting harvested by hunters. Uh, they're probably dying throughout the winter due to poor condition. Doesn't mean that CWD is killing all these deer. However, what it means is deer with CWD are predisposed to higher mortality rates. And as you can see, that's clearly going to be a concern with the overall management trajectory with this deer herd over the coming years. The other disease we have in Michigan is bovine tuberculosis. Uh, and bovine tuberculosis, uh, you do, probably do not hear a whole lot about, unfortunately, in the national news because Michigan is uh, the, the only state with uh, the, the, the disease that's established or endemic in parts of its herd. Um, now, despite some of the early successes in limiting prevalence when it was first detected back in the mid 1990s, the state has never fully achieved its goal of eradication. And each of the last five years has seen TB rates or, or prevalence rates exceed 2% in our core TB area, which we've identified as DMU 452. Uh, persistent TB is a continual threat to our cattle industry and can pose human health risks as well, especially to individuals who frequently handle deer carcasses like hunters, like processors, or taxidermists. So with that, um, I want to talk about some of the changes that were made for 2020. Um, there was an emphasis this year uh, that in the face of some of the challenges that I just recently talked about, we wanted to provide uh, hunters with maximum flexibility with how their deer licenses can be used. We wanted to provide a little bit more value for what those deer licenses are used for. And we wanted to do our best at trying to simplify the regulations in especially in how ch hunters choose to harvest their deer. Now, some of the changes that uh, were made um, uh, are listed here. Now, this is not going to be comprehensive, but it's some of the major ones and it'll get you caught up to speed, uh, especially for what's new for 2020. Some of these uh, include uh, if you are deaf, um, you are now eligible to participate in what we call our Liberty and Independence Hunt. So our Liberty Hunt is the two-day hunt in September. The Independence Hunt is a four-day hunt in uh, October. So individuals who are deaf are now eligible to participate in those hunts where they previously they could not. If you're a youth hunter, uh, anyone under the age of 17, uh, or you have an apprentice license, you are exempt from antler point restrictions. It does not, does not matter uh, which uh, part of the state you hunt in, which license you're hunting with, or which season you're hunting in, you are exempt from antler point restrictions and you can pursue 
any antler deer um, that you that you feel fits your 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 particular value system. We've also uh, increased the maximum number of private land antlerless licenses available to hunters to 10. Uh, we are resuming antlerless opportunities with archery in the Upper Peninsula and select deer management units. And antler point restrictions were removed in parts of DMU 122, which is uh, in the Upper Peninsula. I will point out that uh, these five bullet points are not expected to have any overall impact on our deer herd whatsoever. They're simply meant to provide a little bit more opportunity the one that might stand out is uh, the maximum of 10 private antlerless licenses per hunter. Uh, a lot of people see that and think, oh my gosh, people can shoot 10 antlerless deer. We're, they're going to, uh, I've heard the word annihilate, destroy, decimate the deer herd. And I'm gonna show you why that is not the case. One is that uh, hunters uh, largely limit themselves. And when you look at the number of individuals who purchase antlerless licenses, you see that 60% of Michigan deer hunters don't even purchase an antlerless license already. Another 30% only purchase one, uh, less than 1% purchase five or more. And previously we had parts of the state that allowed 10 antlerless licenses and other parts of the state that allowed five. And that's certainly confusing for hunters who hunt in both areas in terms of what they can and cannot, or how many they can purchase and, and how they can utilize those permits. So we felt it was important to make this a consistent statewide regulation for ease of understanding and, and communicating. Another reason why we don't think this is gonna have an impact is that allowing individuals to purchase 10 antlerless licenses doesn't mean that those individuals will harvest 10 antlerless deer. Again, using some of the recent data that we have uh, from 2018, we know that less than 4% of hunters will harvest three or more deer. And if you happen to know someone who has harvested three or more antlerless deer, then you know somebody who is in the top literally 99% of all Michigan hunters in terms of antlerless harvest per hunter. Now, this slide really shows some of the more notable changes for 2020, and I'm going to go through some of those, and, and this is some of the stuff that is going to be probably most important and, and interesting, uh, especially if you're a hunter. One is that uh, antlerless deer can now be taken on your deer or your combination license during the firearms and muzzleloader seasons in the Lower Peninsula. Previously, that could only be done during the archery season. And if you wanted to take a doe in the firearms or muzzleloader season throughout most of uh, the lower Southern Michigan, lower Michigan, um, you needed an antlerless license. You no longer need that antlerless license to harvest an antlerless deer during these two seasons, provided you have an unfilled uh, deer or, or combination uh, tags. Furthermore, antlerless deer can be taken on your deer or combination license either in the early or late antlerless seasons. So keep in mind that those are private land seasons. Uh, if you wanted to get a head start on your, on your venison needs uh, without requiring the purchase of an antlerless license, you can use uh, your combo, one of your combo tags on uh, a doe in the September early season. Furthermore, if you were unsuccessful in your pursuit of a buck uh, throughout the three major seasons that we have, you now have that license sort of uh, move over into the late antlerless season and you can still utilize that and hopefully get something for it uh, where previously it would have essentially uh, expired or uh, you'd have been relegated to archery uh, pursuits. Uh, all of our uh, late early and late antlerless seasons are open in all uh, mainland lower peninsula DMUs. The muzzleloader season, if you're hunting in zone three, has been reduced from 17 days to 10 days. And I'll talk about that later, but essentially those seven lost days have been replaced uh, with uh, in the late antlerless season. So the days haven't been lost. They just switched from muzzleloader to late antlerless season. And furthermore, all legal firearms used in the muzzleloader uh, can be used during the muzzleloader season in Southern uh, Lower Peninsula. So again, if you're hunting essentially anywhere um, south of like Nuevo County line, essentially Oceana, Nuevo, Macosta, Isabella, Midland, and Bay County, you essentially, muzzleloader season is uh, basically a, a second firearm season. And, and I'll talk about why we made some of those changes and the justification for that. 
and because it's important to dig into what these impacts look like uh, a little bit more to understand why these changes were brought forward. With allowing your antlerless deer to be taken on your deer or combination license, uh, hunters can now have hunters now have that ability, and they've never had that throughout much of the Lower Peninsula in history. The area that does have this regulation the longest in place is what we call DMU 487, and that's the um, six-county area in the Northeast Lower Peninsula that was established uh, for for TB management. That regulation was enacted in 2009. And as you can see, the harvest, both for antlered and antlerless deer, has remained relatively stable uh, over the course of that time. Of course, you still see typical peaks and valleys um, that are associated with uh, maybe weather events or, or something else, but you tend to see essentially a very stable harvest. But it is worth noting that over this time, we've lost about 19% of our hunters from this area. And that 19% isn't because of the regulation that was in place. That's typical attrition that we see uh, anywhere in the state of Michigan. So we're trying to maintain a standard harvest with, with uh, essentially one-fifth less of our hunters in that time. So this change is not meant to reduce the deer herd as it, as it is as much to maintain current harvest levels as we anticipate we continue to lose hunters over time. Now the increased, uh, allowing increased antlerless deer to be taken during like the early and late antlerless seasons is another method where we're essentially providing increased opportunity for harvest. Um, what you should know about these additional seasons is that harvest is generally pretty small compared to what you see what tip, or what typically occurs in the primary season, which is our regular firearm season, our archery season and even the, to a lesser extent our muzzleloader season. So I hear a lot that these added seasons frustrate hunters a lot, whether it's our youth or liberty hunt or our, our early and late antlerless seasons. And they are not meant to be frustrating to people. They're simply meant to provide additional opportunities. Now in previous years, the, the presence of these uh, early or late antlerless seasons may have actually helped with some management goals by, by increasing the harvest enough to, to you know, stabilize the trend or you know, manage the trend in a direction that we're trying to, to, to move that, that specific county's deer herd in. However, with the, number, the fewer number of hunters that we have over time, um, we're really seeing uh, essentially this is added opportunity and less of a, a management value. And then finally, with the allowance of all legal firearms in the muzzleloader season uh, in the Southern Lower Peninsula, many individuals view this as uh, too much effort or increased pressure on our deer herd. Uh, it's worth pointing out that we've actually had this regulation in place in 19 counties in the Southern Lower Peninsula already. And we, we took that opportunity to look at what those trends look like over time. So in 2017, that was the last year that that muzzleloader season in those 19 counties was purely muzzleloader only. So it was very much specific uh, to that, that weapon as the, the season name suggests. In 2018, a change was made to allow all legal firearms um, in those 19 counties during the muzzleloader season. And what you can see is, again, typical uh, attrition rates that we tend to see during the archery or firearm season. We actually saw a slight uptick in participation in the, that muzzleloader season with hunters. And we also saw a slight increase in overall antlerless harvest as well. Um, keeping in mind that the numbers that you saw throughout the archery and firearm season um, were fairly stable. So um, it really did not have that much of an impact overall. Furthermore, when we looked at that data in 2019, uh, again, we saw very similar trends, albeit slightly in the, in the direction that we were, were hoping to see. So overall, we see about 3,000 additional individuals participating in muzzleloader season. We've seen an increase of maybe 3,000 antlerless deer during that season. Keep in mind, this is across 19 counties. So overall, from a management standpoint, um, anything that we can do to keep hunters engaged and improve our antlerless harvest is something that we feel is worth uh, exploring more broadly. 
And finally, some later changes, uh, other changes that we have. Um, our late antlerless season has been expanded in the northern lower peninsula as it was in the southern lower peninsula by one week. So essentially it starts now immediately after the muzzleloader season concludes. Uh, there are carcass movement restrictions in Montcalm and parts of Kent and Ionia counties. Previously that, that carcass movement restriction was applied uh, across 19 counties that I previously spoke of that was uh, constituted our CWD management zone. We decided to really focus on where CWD was being uh, identified or observed most frequently um, and apply that restriction there. And uh, finally, the late archery season, which had previously ex been ex <laughs> extended uh, through January 31st in Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb counties, uh, was again continued uh, again this year for one more year. Uh, the reason we did that was. Uh, that pilot ran out in after three years and we wanted to uh, experiment with that season one more time to get a, uh, one more year of additional data. So I know that's a lot of information I've thrown at you. I think I've been talking now for probably uh, over 40 minutes for sure, but uh, I did want to uh, highlight my, my uh, name, title, uh, address, and the best way to contact me right now since we're still working from home is probably through email. Um, I am always happy to try to answer any questions uh, or concerns or listen to new ideas. Uh, so certainly do not hesitate to use that contact information. I, I just ask that uh, you be patient in a response um, because uh, I share this a lot and get a lot of uh, feedback, I guess I should say. So um, especially with deer season coming up, things are certainly very busy. Um, so with that, um, I will turn it over to Katie and I'm happy to engage in further conversation with anybody. Thanks. Thanks, Chad. Um, we have a couple of questions. So the first question in our uh, question answer uh, pod, and additionally, if you have questions, um, now's the time to, to type those in and we'll go through all of them. The first question is asking, what is the reason for making youth exempt for the APRs and why not use the opportunity to teach sportsmanship? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, so I'll point out that the APR uh, exemption was actually developed by um, what we had what we call a, an APR work group. Um, this work group was uh, established by our Natural Resources Commission. It was, uh, uh, I guess, uh, I put together by some individuals in our executive office. And essentially, what it was was getting a group of people on both sides of the aisle, uh, people who were pro-APR, people who were um, anti-APR, and got them together to help develop and provide some guidance for our antler point restriction policy moving forward. This is one of the recommendations that came out of that, that stakeholder group, that working group. Um, and, the, and the idea was that it's really important, we feel, for our youth hunters to be successful. Um, or, or our, our novice hunters, our, our, our new to hunters. Um, and that's why the apprentice holders were in there as well. So we felt that it was really important uh, to provide a little bit more flexibility with what they can and can't shoot. Ultimately, uh, as a youth participant, they are still sort of beholden to the guidelines that their mentor uh, observes. So if their mentor wants to teach uh, the values of passing a younger a younger buck so it grows older um, that is certainly something that we feel is is worth exploring at that individual level we just didn't feel like it was something that needed to be um, regulated essentially so that option still exists to move forward with um, antler honoring antler point restrictions it's just done so now on a, on a voluntary basis thanks chad mm -hmm. The next question is, um, are the late antler, antlerless seasons on private land only? Uh, that's a good question. And the, the easy answer is uh, actually yes, but <laughs> there's a caveat here. Um, with the regulation changes that occurred this year, uh, there was one, uh, I talk about amendments uh, earlier in the talk, there was one amendment that was passed by our, our commissioners, our Natural Resources Commission. So for, for most of 
the state, yes, uh, the your late aunt on the season is private land only. However, if you are hunting uh, in the counties where, I'm trying to figure out a way to say this, if you're hunting in the counties where uh, the muzzleloader season is essentially now a firearm season, the commission passed an amendment that allows you to pursue uh, any deer on public land in those counties during the late antlerless season only if you are pursuing them with a muzzleloader. So that's super uh, confusing. Um, so the best way I can think of it is if you're in a late antlerless season, um, you can pursue antlerless deer only on private land, or you can pursue any deer uh, with a muzzleloader on public land. And again, that is only for the counties um, sort of along that uh, Oceana, Nuevo, uh, Isabel, Macosta, Isabella line and south. So that would not even apply to the northern lower. So. We're, we're hoping to provide a little bit more clarity on that. Hopefully that makes sense, um, but it's, it's one of those rules that uh, is a little wonky when you try to explain it, but um, hopefully that does the trick. And, and if it doesn't, feel free to shoot a follow-up question. Thanks, Chad. Um, the next question is uh, from Jay, and he says, I know you touched on it partially with the new regulations, and I've heard the opinions of others, but what is your opinion of long-term consequences from the continued decline of hunter licenses? That's a great question, Jay. And that's something that I think every uh, present day and future deer manager and, and agency are going to wrestle with. Um, obviously, uh, I think uh, we've all been taught, and I think I think rightly so, that our, our deer hunters are are our, our management tool for, for whitetail deer. And I do believe that has absolutely been the case throughout much of Michigan's history. However, um, some of the data that you saw, it, it, you can see that it's, it's becoming more and more of a challenge. And uh, to be honest with you, I'm not as confident for uh, our ability now to really be effective at lowering deer population levels. Now that's not to say that there's still not a management value because I do believe we can manage deer herds to be either stable or, or certainly reduce growth um, from, from a hunting public. But I think the ability for hunters to now manage deer um, and, and drive them lower, um, which in certain cases, uh, especially as a goal, uh, especially in parts of our like TB area or maybe even our CWD area, I think that's gonna be much more of a challenge. And I think that's something that we need to start to come to, to realize, especially as other confounding factors with, with society start changing as well. We, we continually see the development of you know, agricultural fields. And, and a lot of times what that does is it takes those areas out of, of a management area where, where hunters previously had access to, um, they, they no longer have access to, but the deer still have access to it. So we're, we're continuing to see increases in conflict with, uh, with deer in, in urban and suburban situations. So um, yeah, it's, it's going to be extremely challenging for, for all the reasons I mentioned. And uh, I, I think it's going to really tax a lot of the decisions and, and that we make here over the next probably 10 to 20 years. Okay, um, just to follow up from Jen on the late antler list, uh, she thanks you for such a clear answer and wonders if that amendment is going to appear in the Hunter Digest. Uh, I do believe it's in there, Jen. Um, I'll be honest with you, um, that went through so many iterations. I, we have got a great staff. I'm pretty sure they captured it, but um, I have not been able to really thumb through it yet. I'm, I'm more of like a have your have your hands on a book digest kind of person instead of sort of scrolling with the mouse online. So I've not really gone through it yet. It should be in there because we've got a great staff that's that's capable of of capturing everything that's changed at the last minute with our uh, our commission when they finalize the regulations. But um, I can't say honestly that I've looked through it and, and identified it and, and able to point you to a, a page yet. So. Okay, thanks. Um, Seth wonders if uh, for the extended season in Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb, 
have you seen a good harvest success and do you think that will continue? Yeah, great question, Seth. Um, I do think that we'll, I think we'll probably wind up proposing that to be, um, I guess, removing the sunset, which essentially means continuing that regulation moving forward without evaluation. Um, I think what it does is it certainly provides a lot more opportunity um, for, for hunters to participate in those areas. To be honest with you, we do not see a lot of participation. We do not see a lot of a really high levels of harvest. Um, I think a lot of people are essentially hunted out at that point. Uh, if you remember earlier in the year, the beginning of January was actually really nice. It was actually beautiful. And we think that there was a little bit more participation in there. Uh, really, one of the reasons why we developed that regulation was we, we wanted to try to work with communities in those areas. And obviously, those three counties were, were chosen specifically because um, of the high number of deer vehicle collisions, the high number of communities in those areas that uh, experience or, or have some sort of complaints and have, have reached out to the agency. Um, and uh, we, we wanted to try to extend an opportunity for those communities to sort of develop a managed hunt where they can sort of uh, use hunters and some of their unused licenses or even some of the, the licenses that hunters might be willing to purchase and recruit them to get into some of those parks and, and golf courses and whatever and try to work on on the conflicts that they have as a as a low cost uh, attempt at a solution uh, in those urban areas. And to be honest with you, I don't know many communities that have really utilized the full capability of of those that extended season. Um, furthermore, when we did our 2019 uh, deer hunter harvest survey, we didn't see a whole lot of support for that outside of the Southeast region. Um, so whereas we think it's kind of a cool idea to, to go out after the season, it's certainly a quiet time when you can get out there with your bow. Um, sometimes antlers have dropped off bucks, sometimes you haven't, but it's really meant to be more of a, a management tool for some of those urban communities or added opportunity. I think there just does, doesn't seem to be a lot of support, but um, as I mentioned earlier, I do think that we probably will uh, recommend moving that forward and, and, and staying with it, at least in those three counties. And then we'll, we'll see how it goes over time and whether or not that, that could or should be expanded. Great. Um, Martin has a question. Um, are there any variations in the regulations for non-residents that you can highlight? Oh, man. Um, I got to think about this one for a second, Martin. Um, Oh, geez. Obviously, um, the, the main difference is, is just sort of cost to participate. And in Michigan, if you're a, a non-resident, you know, your deer license is essentially the same. Where, where they get you is the, the cost of the base license. And the base license is, was sort of a requirement years ago for hunters to participate in. And I think, I think why it was done was to try to avoid some of the direct costs and increases uh, associated with just bumping up the deer license. Instead, you make that requirement where you purchase a base license. It opens up a world of small game opportunities for you, um, but it, uh, it allows you, it allows the department to sort of keep up with some of the increasing costs associated with um, management and uh, still keeps the overall deer license low. It just opens up more opportunities. For a non-resident, that base license is obviously a lot more than it is for a resident. And that's, that's obviously the number one idea. Um, I believe our director just passed a sort of a director's order or director's command, however you want to call it, that even allows uh, your antlerless licenses to be discounted, your, your multiple antlerless license to be discounted if you're a non-resident, um, where previously uh, it would cost you a lot more uh, to, to buy a, a second or additional antlerless tag. So that's a, a change that we recently made really in, in alignment with some of the direction that we're trying to move with our, our overall deer management. But other than that, and, and I really hope I'm, I'm not missing something blatantly obvious, but I, I can't think of too many other exceptions. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm racking my brain, but nothing is coming to mind right away other than the cost. Okay. Um... I guess this is the last call for questions. Uh, everybody that submitted has been answered. Um, and just while you're thinking about those concluding questions, 
Um, I would just like to, in the chat pod, um, I put the MSU Chronic Wasting Disease website in that link. Um, this is a new, a new website that MSU Extension has available and it's constantly changing and being um, added to and populated. So uh, that's something that you'll definitely wanna bookmark. Um, all of these recorded presentations will be um, listed there once. Oh, you didn't see it. Um, oh, shoot, because I sent it to all panelists. <laughs> um, thanks, Seth. You're a lifesaver. Um, so it will constantly be uh, updated. The webinar recordings and other op opportunities will be listed on that site, um, as well as information for hunters, for landowners, for processors. Um, to help mitigate the spread of uh, chronic wasting disease and, and engage with our community members. So um, seeing no more questions, again, I'd like to thank Chad for his time this evening. Um, thank you all for attending. And with that, have a great night.